Hi everyone, welcome back to Strategic Management. In this video, we're gonna cover 13 of the major financial ratios most commonly used in strategic analysis. And we're gonna to try to make it fun and easy. So let's get started. There are five main types of ratios we tend to use in strategic analysis. The first one is profit ratios, followed by liquidity ratios, then activity ratios, then leverage ratios, and finally shareholder return ratios. The main profit ratios we will use are the gross profit margin, the net profit margin, which is also just called net margin or return on sales or ROS, return on assets, also called ROA, return on equity, which is called ROE, and return on invested capital, which is called ROIC. So let's start with the gross profit margin. This is measured as revenue minus cost of goods sold over revenue. So suppose you have this awesome lemonade stand and you sell 200 cups of lemonade at a dollar each. Your revenue is $200. If you had to spend $50 on lemons, sugar, ice, and cups, your cost of goods sold is $50. $200 minus $50 equals $150. And 150 over 200 is 75%. Thus, your gross margin is 75%. Way to go. Now let's take a look at Apple's income statement. Apple's revenues, we will use net sales in 2019, were $260.2 billion. Their cost of goods sold, we will use cost of sales, was $161.8 billion. That means their gross margin was 37.8%. Let's go back to our lemonade stand. We had to pay for more than just lemons and sugar, so we should calculate our net profit margin, also called return on sales or ROS. And this is measured as net income over revenue. So there were other expenses for our lemonade stand, like rent for the stand, pay for staff, signs to promote the stand. If all of those other expenses add up to $50, then your lemonade stand's net income was $100, 200 minus 100 for cost of goods sold and other expenses. Thus, your net margin is 100 over $200, which equals 50%. Let's go back to Apple again. Apple had R&D, selling, general, and administrative expenses, which would also include marketing, interest, and taxes. So its net income was $55.3 billion. 55.3 over 260.2 equals 21.3% net margin. Some people prefer to use earnings before interest in taxes, or EBIT, instead of net income. It really just depends on what your feelings are about the role of interest in taxes in strategy. If we use EBIT, Apple's net margin comes out to 24.6%. Now let's look at return on assets. This is one of my favorite ratios because it's really easy to eyeball on financial statements and it tells you so much. It's measured with net income over assets. So your stand generates revenues with assets like inventory and the stand you're renting and more. And let's say all those assets add up to $275. If you generate $100 in returns, also called net income, with $275 worth of assets, your ROA is 36.4%. To find Apple's total assets, we need to look at its balance sheet. Since Apple's net income is $55.3 billion and its total assets add up to $338.5 billion, its ROA is about 16.3%. Okay, now let's do return on equity or ROE, measured as net income over equity. Equity is the money you invested in those assets, including any earnings you reinvested in the business, but excluding debt or liabilities you have to pay. Let's say you borrowed $50 to set up the stand and paid for the remaining assets yourself. Your equity is $275 minus $50 or $225. Your ROE is $100 over $225, which is 44.4%. Okay, back to Apple. Apple's equity will also be on its balance sheet. Since Apple's net income is $55.3 billion and its shareholders' equity is $90.5 billion, its ROE is 61.1%. That's a really high ROE, but before you get too carried away, we need to talk about ROE for a moment. If a company is publicly held, ROE is not the return to shareholders. The return part is the firm's net income, but it usually will not be paid out in full to shareholders, so it's not the shareholder's return. 
Furthermore, the equity part is the book value of equity paid in by the original founder investors. It is not the market capitalization of the stock bought and sold on the market. If you want to know the return to shareholders, we have a ratio for that coming up later. Okay, now this one's a little bit harder, but it's a really great ratio. Return on invested capital, or ROIC. This is measured as the net income minus any dividends paid out over equity plus interest-bearing debt. This measures the return on all capital invested in the business. The dividend part is only relevant if you're paying out dividends to investors. Your equity is $225 and your interest-bearing debt is $50. So in your business, your invested capital equals the total value of your assets, $275. Liabilities like money you owe to suppliers are typically not interest-bearing debt. Remember your net income was $100, so your ROIC is 100 over 275, or 36.4%. Figuring out interest-bearing debt for Apple is a little harder. We will assume accounts payable, other current liabilities, deferred revenues, and taxes payable are all non-interest-bearing and subtract those from total liabilities. That leaves us with $129 billion for interest-bearing debt. Apple's equity is $90.5 billion, which means their total invested capital is $219.5 billion. Apple had $55.3 billion in net income in 2019 and paid $14 billion in dividends. That means Apple's ROIC is 18.8%. Okay, that was the hardest one. It's all smooth sailing from here. Now we're going to cover liquidity ratios, which are both super easy. We've got the current ratio and the quick ratio. Suppose you have a super cool sneaker manufacturing business. The current ratio is current assets over current liabilities. Current assets are things that can be turned into cash within the year, like cash, money customers owe you, or inventory. Let's say yours adds up to a million. Current liabilities are things you're going to have to pay within the year, like money owed to suppliers or short-term debt. Let's say yours is 900,000. 1 million over 900,000 is 1.11. Good news, your current assets are greater than your current liabilities. You are considered solvent. Now let's talk about the quick ratio. It might not actually be possible to turn inventory into cash within the year at book value because it might not be worth as much as it shows on the balance sheet. The quick ratio takes inventory out of the current ratio. This is really important for businesses that hold a lot of inventory. Let's say your inventory is $100,000. If we take that $100,000 in inventory out of your current assets, your quick ratio comes out to 1. That's great. You're still technically solvent using the quick ratio. Now let's look at J. Crew. J. Crew's current assets for 2019 were $550.6 million. J. Crew's current liabilities for 2019 were $849.5 million. Ruh -roh. J. Crew's current ratio is 0.65. This raises a red flag about its solvency. And to make matters worse, 415.6 million of its current assets is inventory. What if it cannot be sold at book value? J. Crew's quick ratio is only 0.16. Now we're going to talk about activity ratios, including inventory turnover and day sales outstanding. Inventory turnover is measured by dividing the cost of goods sold in the year by the average inventory you have on hand. Let's say you spent a million dollars in supply to make the sneakers you sold last year, and you have $100,000 worth of shoes in inventory at any given point in time. Your inventory turnover is 10. That's pretty good for a sneaker company. J. Crew's inventory was $415.6 million. J. Crew's cost of goods sold was $379.4 million. That means J. Crew's inventory turnover was only 0.9. J. Crew filed for bankruptcy protection in May of 2020, and most people attributed to the coronavirus pandemic. But the truth is, J. Crew was in serious trouble before we even knew about the coronavirus pandemic, and any good analyst would be able to see that just using these simple ratios. Okay, just for fun, what would you guess McDonald's inventory turnover is? Under 25 times a year, 25 to 50 times, 50 to 100 times, or over 100 times? 
If you guessed over 100 times, you are correct. It was 197 times in 2019. Okay, now we'll do day sales outstanding. This is where we see how long it takes you to collect payment from your customers. We calculate it by dividing accounts receivables by your average sales per day. Let's say you earned $2 million in revenues selling sneakers this year. And at any point in time, you had about 165,000 in accounts receivables. That is money that is still owed to you by customers. First, we'll figure out your average sales per day by dividing $2 million by 365 days of the year. Then we'll divide your accounts receivables by that number. We come up with about 30 days. That's not bad if you're selling mostly to retailers. It's too long if you're selling direct to consumers who are paying with cash, check, or credit card. J. Cruz receivables were $42.1 million. J. Cruz revenues were $588.8 million. Their day sales outstanding comes out to about 26 days. That's too long for a clothing retailer selling primarily direct to consumers. We would expect them to be able to collect in somewhere between 3 to 10 days. Now that you understand day sales outstanding, what would you guess Starbucks's day sales outstanding is? One day? 11 days? 30 days? Over 100 days? If you guessed 11 days, you are correct. It was 11 days in 2019. Okay, we're up to leverage ratios now. We're going to cover debt to equity and times interest earned, also called TIE. Suppose you have an idea for a cool new augmented reality adventure game. We're going to calculate your debt to equity. That's your total liabilities to total equity. You need $40,000 to program your cool game, so you spend $20,000 from your savings and borrow $20,000 from a bank. You have no other liabilities. Your debt to equity ratio is 1. To calculate your times interest earned, we would divide your earnings before interest and taxes by your interest expense. But you aren't earning any revenues yet, so TIE is not really relevant for you yet. Let's look at the giant internet conglomerate Alibaba. Alibaba's total liabilities are 548.5 billion Chinese yuan. Alibaba's total equity is 764.5 billion Chinese yuan. Alibaba's debt to equity is thus 0.72. No alarm bells here. Alibaba has no net interest expense. In fact, it's making money on interest in its financing operations. So let's look at McDonald's. McDonald's earnings before interest and taxes, or EBIT, is labeled here as operating income and is about $9.1 billion. McDonald's interest expense is about $1.1 billion. So McDonald's TIE is about 8.3, suggesting McDonald's can easily cover its interest expense. Now we've got our last category, shareholder return ratios, including total shareholder returns and the price to earnings ratio. Your augmented reality game is a big hit and you take your company public in an initial public offering. Let's evaluate the shareholder returns for your first year. Total shareholder returns are measured as the stock price at time t plus 1 minus the stock price at time t plus the dividends for the year, all over the stock price at time t. Your stock price at the beginning of last year was $10. Now your stock price is $12 and you haven't paid any dividends. This means your total shareholder returns are 20%. Nice job. The price to earnings ratio or the P to E ratio is measured as the market price per share over the earnings per share. Your stock price is $12 and your earnings per share are 60 cents. So your P to E is 20. That indicates some optimism on the part of the stock market that you're going to continue to grow. Now let's talk about Tencent, maker of Fortnite and WeChat. Tencent's stock price at the close of December 1st, 2018 was 312 Hong Kong dollars, and its stock price at the close of December 1st, 2019 was 376 Hong Kong dollars. Tencent also paid a dividend of $1 in 2019. Tencent's total shareholder returns are thus 20.6%. Pretty great returns. Tencent's stock price in August 2020 was about 527 Hong Kong dollars. Its most recent earnings per share announced before August, reported in June 2020, was 11.78. Tencent's P to E is thus 44.7. That's very, very high. The stock market is extremely optimistic about Tencent, though you should worry about whether the stock is overpriced. 
And that's it. In 15 minutes, you learned how to use profit ratios, liquidity ratios, activity ratios, leverage ratios, and shareholder return ratios.